this was an irresistible invitation, and I think the fascination of the topic is manifest in all of your presence here tonight. Um, it occurred to me as I was preparing for this that whether the self uh, is a fundamental reality, what we experience as our identity and inner life, uh, that question may ultimately be in the same category of whether there's an afterlife, in the sense that uh, what we can obtain by way of evidence uh, may by definition remain a matter of subjectivity and metaphysical, metaphysical choice, open to multiple interpretations, and ultimately unprovable with the tools we have at hand. Though, as we are going to discuss tonight, science uh, and philosophy are refining their tools for uh, investigating this aspect of life, investigating what is subjective, what we have known as subjective. Uh, and the thinkers on this panel are contributing to that process from very different fields of experience and knowledge. Uh, Pim van Lommel of the Netherlands came to this as a cardiologist by way of discovering and then pursuing the meaning of near-death experiences. Evan, Thomas, uh, Evan Thompson and Thomas Metziger, Evan is at the University of Toronto, Thomas University of Mainz, are working in the borderlands, I think of, as uh, between philosophy and neuroscience, philosophy both Eastern and Western. Um, an Australian journalist who is interviewing you, Thomas, wrote, uh, from out-of-body experiences to lucid dreaming, anarchic hand syndrome to phantom limbs, his investigations have taken him to places few dare to go, be spooked, bewildered, amazed. And as I was reading that and reading all of you, I was re brought back to a conversation I once had with someone working in the field of cloning. And she described her field as the realm of fiction science. But I think what we're about to start discussing here is another realm of fiction science, but these are inner frontiers, right? Um, inner frontiers of mind, consciousness, self, will inner worlds that may amaze and even perhaps frighten us. But Thomas, I'd like to start with you. Um, I think that you, uh, among the, uh, of the three of you, are the most resolute in insisting that the self is an illusion. And so I wonder if you would just start by telling us what you mean by that and how you, how you came to that. Well, I wouldn't put it like that. Uh, people who like to intoxicate themselves in New Age bookstores they like concepts like that self is an illusion. But if one looks a little closer, the first question one would have would be, who is having this illusion? So this illusion talk itself is conceptually problematic. If I had to stay with it, I would rather say it's an illusion that's no one's illusion or something like that. Um, I think it is pretty obvious that there is no such thing as a self. As you know, philosophers all disagree all the time, but there's a pretty uh, strong consensus in my discipline that the self is not a substance. It's not a provocative uh, claim. It's actually something almost trivial. A substance for philosophers is something that could hold itself in existence, is ontologically self-subsistent, as we say, that could maintain its own being, say, also in the absence of a living brain or something like that. And that the self is not a thing in the brain or a thing outside of this world, that, that seems pretty, pretty obvious, obvious to most of my colleagues. I would say what is very robust and very real is what we call the phenomenal self. Of course, there is a self that appears in conscious experience. I feel like I'm someone. But that is not a thing, but a process. That process is very different during the dream state. In dreamless deep sleep, there is no phenomenal self, no self as experience. And now, I hope at least all of you uh, enjoy this, as we call phenomenal selfhood. And I think, in its essence, this process is a representational process. So what we call a self or the self in folk psychological discourse is actually a reified time slice of an ongoing process in which your brain makes an image of you, your body, your emotional state, your memories, your plans, your social relationships, and so forth. So, not an entity, but a process. You have uh, 
use the metaphor that the that the ego is like a that consciousness is like a tunnel. Ex right. Explain what you mean by that. Well, I think the knowledge we have about the world, and we do have knowledge about the external world, is a very real phenomenon. But if we just speak about consciousness in the sense of how it appears to us subjectively, it is a locally determined phenomenon. Uh, to cut a long story short, I think if all the properties of your brain are fixed, what you will consciously experience will also be fixed too. So in that sense, it is an inward phenomenon, but what I'm getting at, you know, I've been in this consciousness community for many years, uh, with working with neuroscientists and philosophers. Consciousness is not one problem, it's a whole bundle of problems, but there is something like a deepest issue, a core issue, and that is the question is, who has all these states? And who or what is this self that lives through all these experiences? And that's how I come to this. Uh, that's why I'm interested uh, in all of this. And as it turns out, to have a phenomenal self is a, a process that's very highly dependent and determined by information processing in your brain, for instance. It's the content of an image. And if I just may say that one thing, the special thing about your self-model right now, about the self-model active in all of your brains right now, is that it is as philosophers say, transparent. That means you cannot experience it as an image. So you are not only naive realists about everything you see, the colors and the objects, but also about the content of the self-model that is active in your brain right now. You identify with this image. It's like you're glued or attached to its content. And that's why you have the mistaken idea that you're someone. Um, so you've said that the conscious self that navigates reality is a computational tool. So really, we were all living in virtual reality all along, but just now invented the concept. And that creates this interesting, I mean, the interesting sense of inwardness. It's not just that it is something in the brain or in a reality model of the brain. What I'm trying to get at is this subjective quality of inwardness, because that seems to be the essence of the mystery to me. And it is a mystery. Yes, but I think we have the conceptual tools at hand mm -hmm. to understand how it could come about. How could any information processing system, a natural system that has no self or no sharp identity, develop the robust experience that it is a self and has an identity through time? That's what I'm interested in. Mm -hmm. and, but, and absolutely biologically rooted and dependent. Well, no, I think uh, the human conscious self doesn't only have neural correlates, it also has social correlates. The human self model is very special in many respects, different from those our animal ancestors have. There's a part that's not transparent, we're not fully caught in illusion. It has strong social correlates, uh, mm -hmm. that's a very important um, aspect of it. But there's an inbuilt conflict in the human self model. We have this emotional layer, which has a very strongly inborn biological imperative, and that is you must not die. You have to survive, you know. Those who didn't have that, they weren't our ancestors. And uh, then we have this brand new, slow cognitive self model, our frontal lobe, that doesn't work so well as we all know, but that makes us the first animal on this planet to have a clear, conscious, and explicit knowledge of the fact that we will die. So there is an inbuilt, I don't know how I would say this in, in English, a, a chasm or a schism or a split in our self-model. And that creates this constant attempt in beings like us to become whole again, to heal ourselves, to somehow reconcile with what we know, with what we feel just must not be true under all any circumstance, namely that we are mortal beings. Mm -hmm. So mortality mm -hmm. is as much a defining factor in our sense of selfhood and identity as anything else. Absolutely, I think. And I mean, apart from all these difficult philosophical and scientific questions in these exciting times right now, I think that is the core issue that is also relevant for everybody. Mortality. Um, can
can one come to terms with it without fooling oneself? Or is this something, if you're really honest to yourself, that one just cannot come to terms with? So you've made a very interesting proposal, and I want to move on now, but come back to that later, that because of these very important questions that you see being raised as we look closer at this, that we need a new, as you said, a new ethics of consciousness. So Evan, um, you were actually raised in, an, in a very unique environment that sought to bring together the arts and humanities, science and technology in a not just intellectually, but in a way of life. Um, and so I don't think it's, I, I, I can imagine some kind of line between that and the fact that you are now navigating this territory between, say, the Western mind-brain mind perspective of consciousness, viewing consciousness and studying it as a biological, biological phenomenon, and the Indian-Tibetan perspective uh, of consciousness that has some kind of primary reality, perhaps that is transcendent uh, of the body. Tell me, um, <laughs> that's the background. Um, so just, just tell us a little bit about, about that place you stand in and how you come to these issues. Uh, all right, well, since I'm in New York City, yeah. actually I will say just a little bit about my background. Um, I was raised in the 1970s in a, in a community alternative educational institute called the Lindisfarne Association, which was actually located in the Episcopal Church at 6th Avenue and 20th Street, which is now the Limelight Market, which I walked by today. Yeah. And um, it was an organization founded by my father, William Roman Thompson, and what he was trying to do was to bring together uh, scientists, artists, and spiritual teachers from a variety of, of different uh, spiritual uh, traditions. So I was raised in a community of ongoing discussion between Buddhist monks and Buddhist philosophers and, and uh, neuroscientists and anthropologists and poets and writers. And so what's very important to me, um, what, I, what I learned from growing up in that context is that there are multiple ways of knowing and multiple ways of seeing reality. And that it's very, uh, it's very ethically important, I think, to respect that. And in my own work, what I try to work with are ways of knowing that are, on the one hand, rooted in, in science, in neuroscience. I'm a philosopher by training, and I work very closely with neuroscientists who are interested in, in mental functioning and the sense of self and consciousness. But I also uh, work with uh, both philosophers and scientists who are interested in the neuroscience of meditation and who have a background in, in Indian and Tibetan contemplative traditions mainly. So what is at the heart of my work is really the idea that first-person mental training through, let's just call them mindfulness methods as a kind of umbrella term, that those first-person methods of mental training can help us to understand how the sense of self is constructed, how attention functions, how attention is trainable, how there are different kinds of awareness that are also trainable, how you can um, learn to differentiate in your own experience between, say, the sense of self that you have now as an embodied being sitting here in the room listening to my remarks, and then the sense of self that involves when your mind wanders and when you get caught up in a train of thought either about what you're going to do tomorrow or something that happened to you at breakfast or something you remember from your personal past, where the sense of self is now a sense of self that depends on a consciousness of time and a mental image that you have of yourself in the past or in the future. This is, these are different senses of self that are intertwined and confounded from moment to moment mixed together in our experience. And with mental training through mindfulness, one can actually see these in a first-person way from moment to moment, changing, oscillating, fluctuating. And individuals who have a great degree of training in this kind of attentiveness to their own experience um, have been shown in very concrete neuroscience settings to be able to provide information that's valuable to neuroscientists who want to disentangle different kinds of systems in the brain that construct our sense of self. For example, the sense of self that you have in your body in the present moment versus the sense of self that you have when you time travel mentally to the past or future. And individuals with mindfulness training can switch reliably between different modes of awareness in a way that um, gives neuroscientists new tools for interpreting the activity that they see in, say, the context of, of fMRI or, or uh, EEG studies. So one of the things you've said is that you advocate an embodied approach to the self, not a neurocentric one. 
What, what's the importance of that distinction? Well, the importance of, of that for me is that um, I think it was the, the perceptual psychologist, J.J. Uh, Gibson, who said, we need to ask not just what's in the brain, but what the brain is in. So what is the brain in? It's in a living, breathing body caught up in multiple ways with the environment, in perception and action, in a social context. Our human sense of self, as, as Tomas was mentioning, is an intersubjective sense of self. That um, intersubjective relatedness means that the, the, the self can't be understood by simply going inside the brain and looking at neural patterns of activity. It's as if you were to try to understand Gothic architecture by just looking at the stones. It's the wrong level. It's a, it's a crucially important level, but it's not the relevant level for the intersubjective uh, sense of self that we have. So it's, what I mean by that in a nutshell is, is this larger context of embodiment and, and embeddedness. And um, it, I, are you involved in the mind-life dialogue? Yes. Right. yes. So the Dalai Lama is doing, is, is kind of spearheaded and set in motion a lot of this interesting dialogue between neuroscience and philosophy and religion. Um, and and I, I recently had a conversation with the Dalai Lama's translator, Tupton Jinpa, mm -hmm. who's part of those and also a, uh, a, a Buddhist scholar in his own right. And we talked about this uh, chasm that remains and that may remain, ha however fruitful and fascinating those dialogues and the research that flows from them uh, remain. Um, between a Western view of consciousness as essentially biologically rooted and limited to biology, and the far reaches of, let's say, Tibetan Indian philosophy, where there is something, um, Tupton Jinpa described it maybe as a, a stream of consciousness, not consciousness whole, not this entire thing we call the self, but something that, in fact, let's say, in Tibetan Buddhist teaching, in the person of the Dalai Lama, for example, has transcended particular bodies and time and space. So where do you, uh, where do you come out on, on that? So the, so the core of that question, as I understand it, is whether consciousness is essentially or fundamentally a biological process, or whether there's some aspect of consciousness that, that transcends biology, and then that could be interpreted in different ways. Um, I think that's an open question. It's also um, one of these things we can't prove. I think it's an open question, but I think that, it, that, that intellectual rigor and honesty requires recognizing that from a scientific perspective, as it's presently articulated in our uh, bodies of knowledge, that at least as I see it, there isn't compelling evidence that pushes us in the direction of a, of a biologically transcendent view of consciousness. Mm -hmm. And we've had this discussion with, with uh, the Dalai Lama and other Buddhists on a number of occasions, and the, the, the point we usually come to is a, is a, a mutual respect for, for different perspectives. And what I see as really the crucial thing in a way from the, that, that Buddhism brings home, but we can also see it in Western philosophy and in phenomenology, say, is not so much the metaphysics of whether consciousness transcends the brain or the body, but rather that from a Buddhist perspective, the starting point is the, is the primacy of consciousness in an experiential sense. So as a scientist, when you're examining the brain, you're doing it within an experiential framework of your own observations, your perceptions, the intersubjective agreement that you can establish with other observers, other uh, uh, conscious beings. And so consciousness in that sense as a mode of knowing is fundamental. There's no way of stepping outside of consciousness to sort of see it sideways on and to see how it relates to something else. So there, I think, the Buddhists are very rigorous. That's their starting point, mm -hmm. to stay with the primacy of experience. And I think they've also brought a very sophisticated uh, and ancient tradition of thinking about consciousness in quite subtle ways, right? I mean, there, there's uh, gross consciousness, subtle consciousness. Mm -hmm. um, pure luminous consciousness, right? And that those, that those terms also have become useful for, for science. Well, to take a concrete example, um, you know, Thomas said that consciousness disappears in deep sleep. And, and this is how we think about it in Western neuroscience and clinical science and in Western philosophy. In Indian philosophy, there are long, detailed, fascinating debates about whether consciousness persists in deep sleep, whether there's a kind of subliminal awareness and sense of self that's not a reflective or introspective sense of self, but it's a kind of subtle awareness 
that enables there to be a memory bridge between waking and sleep and dreaming. So there I think actually you know, we could make some headway using neuroscience and other philosophical resources to tackle this question about um, subtler states of consciousness that are, that are uh, you know, more difficult to understand in the spectrum and map of, of mind states. And that also will help us understand something about our ordinary everyday selves. Mm -hmm. I think that's also the connection that's a bit harder to see on the outside. Pim van Lommel, you um, came to this from an unusual vantage point as a doctor, as a cardiologist, becoming aware of the phenomenon of near-death experience. Um, so you, I mean, just to take that a step farther, you started thinking about consciousness in, as something that manifests itself in states of clinical death. Right? <laughs> um, so I wonder what view of the self, your study of that, your immersion in that, I and mean, you've really given yourself over to that, um, has given you. Is the self an entity? What is the relationship uh, between the self and biology, and is it something other than biology? Well, how I was raised as, an, as an, a physician, and we thought always that, that consciousness was just a product of the function of the brain. That was my opinion as well. And as a cardiologist, I was involved in many, many resuscitations. And the moment I started to ask patients who had survived the cardiac arrest, it was in 86, uh, if they had memories of the period of consciousness, the period of cardiac arrest, which is called clinical death. There is no circulation, no breathing. And if you don't start your resuscitation, between five to 10 minutes, patients will ultimately die because of irreversible damage of the brain. And to my big surprise, within two years, I heard 12 out of 50 patients who had survived a cardiac arrest who told me about an enhanced consciousness during this period of a non-functional brain. And this started for me just the curiosity because it didn't fix in what I had learned. And um, so out of scientific curiosity, we started a study in, in 88, and we studied uh, 344 consecutive <coughs> patients who survived the cardiac arrest, and 18% of them had memories of the period of cardiac arrest. And there was no explanation when you compare the 18%, the 62 patients who had a, the death experience, with so an enhanced consciousness with the 82% who did not have any memories. There was no difference at all in the duration of cardiac arrest, two minutes or eight minutes, the duration of unconsciousness. If they were five minutes unconscious of three weeks in coma, they give a medication, uh, fear of death before the arrest, uh, foreknowledge, religion, uh, gender. So we couldn't explain why people can have this experience of enhanced consciousness. And they have cognition, self-identity, emotions. They can have a review of someone's life with memories from, from early childhood. And in that, this enhanced consciousness, they are feeling connected with everything and everybody. It's, it's a, what they also call it, it's, a, it's an experience of oneness, of unity. Everything is connected. And when you have a life review of, uh, let's say, in the cardiac arrest of two minutes, you can talk a day or more about it. Everything happens at the same time. Instantaneous, you are there. Everything is connected. And then we started to think about what happens in the brain during cardiac arrest. So we know that the function of the brain stops. There, there's no blood flow in the brain. Within two seconds, you become unconscious within two seconds. The function of the cortex is gone, so there are no body reflexes, body is no pain reflexes. The brain stem reflexes are gone. So the gag reflex, the corneal reflex, the breathing stops with the respiratory center close to the brain stem. So the clinical findings are there's no function of the brain left, brain stem or cortex. And when you have the measurement of the electrical activity of the brain, the EEG, within 50 seconds, it's a flat line. And then the interesting aspect of the death experience is the out-of-body experience, that people can have theoretical perceptions, which can be corroborated later by doctors or nurses or family members, 
that they can tell exactly into detail what happened during the resuscitation. Right, and these are the things that make it um, that legitimize legitimate in some exactly. sense. Right? For yeah. example, that you tell the yeah. story of someone who who had his dentures from you removed, yeah. Uh, yeah. and and later on recognized um, the, the person who had taken the dentures out, and his eyes yeah. were closed. So yeah. that kind of takes this out of the realm of. Well, maybe these people are making up stories to say that there's yeah. some. I mean, there's a, there's a lot that people have done to, uh, so to there, take it seriously the, it's, scientifically. It's, you can let's say this, a, you can corroborate this theoretical perception. There has been a recent review of about 100 cases, cases of out of body experiences, and 90 percent was 100 percent correct. Which means it is not an illusion of hallucination or illusion. So for me. I would, I would like, like to call, call it the, the ego. It's, it's what we, in our body, in our waking consciousness, or ego, uh, have you when we are waking, or daily consciousness. But the people, when they have an out body experience, when the brain doesn't function anymore, they have still have the self identity. And in the higher dimension, everything is connected, and the, let's say, the subject object reality disappears. Everything is one, everything is connected. And this is what the people tell us in the moment that the brain obviously doesn't function. Uh, this is a good moment to remind you that if you have questions, um, please write them down and they'll be collected in just a minute. So where does that take you? It takes you that, um, in my opinion, the brain is not the producer of consciousness, but it is the facilitator. It makes it possible that you experience your wake consciousness in your body when you're awake and the self or the higher self and the enhanced consciousness is the higher aspect and so the ego is just an aspect that you can experience in your body and people tell me and I've spoken to hundreds and hundreds of those people also people who had a traffic accident or are in coma children who were near drowning uh, women who had loss of blood with childbirth but also even your meditation or uh, really depression can have this kind of enhanced consciousness when the brain functions normally. So not only is it that the brain is not the producer of consciousness but the facilitator. I mean another way you come at this quite differently is you say consciousness actually pervades the body. Right. Not, not just that the body doesn't merely it is produce just some, It's coming and in. And yeah. this comes from uh, stories of people who've had transplants, for example. So let's open this up for a few minutes before we take questions from the audience. I, I'm, I'm curious about how you react to each other's ideas. I mean, is, is there something in, in, in these stories that... Um, what are the questions that arise for you, for example, Evan and Thomas, of, of this kind of experience and perspective oh. on this? As you may remember, in this popular book, I have briefly reported that I've had out-of-body experiences myself as a young man. And in the beginning, they were extremely realistic and very convincing. I'm just like Evan, a long-term meditator. They occurred in the context of very long 10-week meditation retreats. In the beginning, I thought, oh, God, boy, have you been so arrogant. All this sto story about soul travel and astral bodies, it's literally true. It was really shocking. Uh, now, I think they're all complex hallucinations, and I'm working in the lab with neuroscientists to produce them in healthy subjects. So I've had a long, long journey. One thing one has to say is... There are just no verifiable perceptions in the OBE state under controlled lab conditions in a sleep lab. I've tried during my own OBEs three decades ago to make verifiable observations. I've tried to experiment very systematically, and I have not been able to make a single. I always try to fly to my girlfriend and observe things in, in her room and stuff. It never worked. So I have never been able to produce an intersubjectively verifiable um, perception. In it, but I can understand this is so realistic um, how people just from that one experience must believe in life after death for the rest of their life. Um, that's just a very, very uh, natural thing. I think the only answer is <clears throat> we would have to bring these experiences, and that's what we're doing, 
into control strict lab conditions. Uh, it, we must, you know, bring it into a strictly scientific context. People are trying this, and there are no verifiable observations. Uh, that's one thing. Um, also, one must see that maybe the OBE is a cardiac arrest patient, or a yogi in this cave in the Himalaya, or an epileptic patient has maybe very different things. It's perhaps not all the same kind of, of experience. So what, to, to cut a long story short, what gave me doubt was that a friend of professor of psychology asked, I, I was firmly against her. She was trying to convince me that those were hallucinations, and I just couldn't believe it. And the way I came bewin, uh, convinced was when she asked me, how do you move? Like, say you've left your body and then you go to the, you try to fli flip a light switch and it doesn't work and then you go to the window and try to fly out. And then I realized I don't walk and it is actually like thinking of the next landmark in your cognitive map in your brain you want to go to, you're al almost there. So there are actually empty holes uh, how you move in the out of body state between memory points which are very salient. And then I started to realize, oh, it is constructed. So it's a cognitive process, you're saying? It's, no, it's I, you know, I have a model of my bedroom at night, and then maybe I go out of body to the light switch, to the windowsill, try to go outside. But in between, there are gaps. I'm not walking, I'm not smoothly flying. There are these breaks, and that these breaks show you that this is actually an internal model the brain uh, tries to create, and that model has certain gaps. It's not filled. And when I then closely inspected my motion patterns in the out-of-body state, I suddenly um, developed doubt. Uh, that's how I became convinced. Mm -hmm. so can, I, can I have some remarks? First of all, there has never been any possibility to induce real out-of-body experience. What has been done and written in the medical literature is bodily illusions. Also Penfield, also Blanca have never induced a real out-of-body experience, Very perception yes. out above the body. And what I mentioned as well, even blind people from birth who even dream without any pictures have had theoretical out-of-body experiences. So it's not a product of the brain does know. And what I just said, the review of about 100 cases, corroborated cases of potentially theoretical out-of-body perceptions, were 90%, 100% true. And it is not, it, it, it's an operation room, it's, it's a resuscitation room, it's, it's in a car accident, it's not in an environment you know before. And, and the, peop, the, the patient you the, described with the dentures, he was in coma when he entered the hospital. Right, these are catastrophic, cataclysmic. Exactly. So, and, and I think the main object, uh, uh, challenge is to find all those people and to corroborate the perceptions. And that's what has been done and what we do. And you cannot induce real out of body experience. Yeah, yeah so I'd, I'd like to say some things about this. Um, th there's two things I want to say. Uh, the first is that. Um, at least based on my own reading of the literature, I'm not convinced that there are verifiable perceptions that meet the standards of evidence that we would want in cognitive psychology and in neuroscience. Secondly, there are real difficult issues about time. The, when you make a retrospective report about an experience that you had and you time it, you are subjectively representing time, but that's different from the objective timing of some event that's going on in the brain or in the body. So we, we don't know that the time at which an experience is occurring is the time at which these biological events are going on. It could be, but we don't know this without some serious kinds of neuroscientific investigations that haven't, that haven't been, psychological and neuroscientific investigations that, that haven't been done. So this has to do with the subjective consciousness of time. But now the second point I want to make is that I think it's a mistake to treat the discussion about near-death experiences 
as whether these experiences are veridical or hallucinatory. Because I think what is fundamentally important in the near-death experience is that it's an experience that people have in the process of dying. And it says something very important about the phenomenology of the dying process. And this is something that the biomedical model of death has absolutely nothing to say about. It treats death as the cessation of biological function and says nothing about the subjective experiential process of what it is to die. Now, this is something that in the contemplative traditions of um, certainly of Asia, but also in Western contemplative traditions, there is a rich literature on the subjective process of the breakdown of your mind and body as you die. And the, these experiences that are now occurring, it, that are now being reported, I think have to be seen in, in this way, that we have an ethical responsibility to face death as a subjective process and to think about what it means to train ourselves to deal with something that we're all going to face and we don't know how each of us is going to face it. So this, I think, is the real value in the near-death experience research, is that it brings out the fact that, that dying is something um, that has this experiential uh, structure to it. And, um, and, and this, I think, is really very, very important. Okay, so we keep coming back to mortality, but I really don't <laughs> want to stay there for the rest of our half hour. So let, I mean, let me bring this back to life a little bit. Um, here's a really interesting echo for me that you all come back to and work with in different ways. Uh, and let's say uh, there are these distinctions that I think neuroscientists are still making and philosophers are still making. <clears throat> we're, we're fudging this a bit. There's brain, mind, consciousness, right? self. Um, there's also awareness, which may not be the same thing as consciousness. Um, it's interesting to me that this pure awareness, Evan, that, that is so uh, much investigated in Buddhist tradition, um, is actually what these near-death patients describe. This, what did you say, this sense of oneness? Um, and Thomas, in your writing, I've also seen you write about the ego tunnel, the, the tunnel of consciousness. And yet, as human beings, we are capable of these moments of awareness, which might be this pure awareness, that in fact, in the, in the moment of becoming aware of the tunnel, we do in fact rise above it or transcend it in some sense. Mm. I mean, it's an interesting well, thing about being human, and it's a question in this whole discussion. I don't know if you're interested in this, but of course there is a wider context in which all this research is taking place. And that context is uh, the situation we are undergoing a historical transition now, wanted or not. I call it the naturalistic turn in the image of man. There's a lot of knowledge coming up that is emotionally unsettling. Neuroscience contributes to the philosophical project of self-knowledge, but it hurts us. Uh, it is difficult. For and, example, this well, difficult knowledge. We are less rational than we thought we are. We are much le more vulnerable beings than we thought, and so on. We're less moral uh, than we like to think we are. And there is this thing, mortality, you don't want to talk about. So um, I think what we actually would need to do as societies, we have to create a new cultural context for this very difficult transition process, else we will just get swept away by the psychosocial consequences in the shift in the image of ourselves and the new technologies, brain neurotechnologies that are emerging. And the, the core question for me is, is if there can be in some sense a fresh and new way of a fully secularized spirituality. So to put it differently, if intellectual honesty, like the core of the scientific attitude, and an absolutely clean form of spirituality can actually coexist or can. And I think that uh, um, is also what you asked about. There are I've, a number of things I think people are not fully aware of. Let me just make three bold statements here. Uh, I think the opposite of religion is not science. The opposite of religion is spirituality. And um, the scientific attitude, the strictly rational attitude can be described as a special case of the spiritual attitude to life and the world. And actually, the scientific, very sober, rigorous approach to it all, and the spiritual um, approach to reality and life and science, 
stem from the same values, from the same normative spring or core, actually. And it has something to do with truthfulness. I guess the English word is veracity, the will, the pure will to absolute veracity, but also accepting the obligation to, for, for veracity towards yourself. That is where spirituality departs from religion, and that is also where there's a bridge from spirituality into modern science, because that is just what it is, you know. Uh, ultimate veracity also towards what you know and what you don't know. And I don't know if this is something you were trying to get at, but that is what I would describe at the, as the wider context in this period we're now going through together, mm -hmm. all of us, wanted or not. Perhaps I can comment something that yes. there's a, let's say, the, the, the discussion is, is philosophy also science? And, and what is the definition of science? Mm. You have scientific methods of empirical science, but science for me is asking questions with an open mind. Forget the concept and look what you see and try to understand. This is science. So. A lot of people, science is just, uh, let's say, a dogma. And for me, science shouldn't be a dogma. Science should be f forgetting concepts and be open. And at least that happened to me as well. And then you have to change. I have a quote, uh, he who never changed his mind have never learned something. So you ha you, if you get new things, if you always stay with your own old concepts, you don't learn anything. So here's a question from the audience. Is there an afterlife? <laughs> and I don't think anyone here can answer that question definitively, but I will ask you, where does this fascination you have, what you know about near-death experiences, where, where does that take you in your thinking about creative intelligence, God, a higher yeah, power? Yeah. Does it make you I, believe in that? First of all, I never used the word afterlife. I talk about the continuity of consciousness. I, I talk about the, I think consciousness is fundamental in the universe, and everything originates from consciousness. So when you talk about continuity of consciousness, it is it, like death like birth could be just a changing state of consciousness. And uh, and that's what I learned from all those hundreds and hundreds of people who wanted to share their, their death experience with me. So, so do you think about, and this is drawing on another question, there being a source of this enhanced consciousness? Or is, is that question, I mean, my experience of scientists thinking about yeah. spirituality is that they often don't have a need to tie it up. Right? I mean, they, they may say, this is an open question. I don't know what it means. I don't need to call it God. Um, I think there are so many levels in consciousness, and I think the higher the level of consciousness, it's the enhanced consciousness, the level of unity, the level of oneness, and the above will be a, a level we don't have any idea about. And I think that will be the source of everything, the source of the universe, the source of consciousness, the source of life, and we will never understand these sources, I think. How do you think about this, Evan? Well, I, what's important to me is to turn our attention to consciousness as we experience it here and now, and as we live it through states like waking and dreaming and memory and mind-wandering and lucid dreaming and out-of-body experiences. So the full range of, of states, um, I think, is, is, is really important to attend to phenomenologically and scientifically. But to go beyond that is to speculate. And I'm not a speculative philosopher. I'm a philosopher who likes to work phenomenologically and with what the evidence, the phenomenological evidence and the, and the, and the scientific evidence uh, presents, presents us with. Mm -hmm. um, question, how do, how do digital and social media impact our sense of self? This may get back to what you were saying, Thomas, how the world is changing and changing us. Um, how do digital and media, social media impact s stream of consciousness? How do you think about this? Very important question. Totally underestimated in its, in its relevance, <coughs> I think. Um, we have many means to change consciousness now. There is 
cognitive enhancers, neurotechnology brain implants, but I think what many people still underestimate is these new medial environments in which we operate. Our brains just did not evolve uh, for um, the internet and this, I guess the, the average British citizen now is 46% of its waking times online. It's connected to a medium, a, a mobile phone or a, a computer or in front of a TV set. And I can see in my students how things change rapidly in, only in the last five years. I mean, the attention span is collapsing. Um, they are, I can only multitask on three channels. They must multitask on five channels or they get nervous. A new generation is growing up and the embedding of this natural virtual reality uh, Mother Nature has created, which we now call conscious experience, into these larger technical systems of representing reality and processing information. I think still today, although we talk about it, we have no idea how this will change us. And I can also only say um, it changes me a lot. You, know, you become hooked on these little novelty stimuli, you know. And um, research has shown in Germany, for instance, that the average time when you are interrupted in the workflow is 11 minutes. Um, the phone rings or a new email message pops up or somebody knocks on your door. What the frightening thing is, almost half of these interruptions of awareness, these interruptions of the attempt to stay in a moment with one task, are self-generated. This shows, I don't know if you've realized this, that the brain learns, I will be interrupted anyway after about 11 minutes. So if finally nobody calls and you could stay with your work, you, you still check, to, your you email. check your bank account, right. you know. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, it's dangerous, you know, if, the, if we train ourselves to be in, inattentive and fragmented. Interesting to think about this emerging field of understanding consciousness and the brain, and this change in life, which as you say is happening in real time, almost too quickly for us to process or understand what it means and how it's changing us. Yeah. I think, it, I think one of the deepest cores of the sense of self is, I call this attentional agency. And that in a nutshell, that's the sense that you control the focus of your attention. An infant, infant doesn't, doesn't have that. that. If, if you're, you're seriously drunk, drunk you, you lose it. it. In, in old age, dementia, dementia you lose it. And, and if, if you, you think, think about it, it, if you lose the capacity to control your focus of attention, then you lose a core element of your conscious self model. And I call these, you know, the entertainment and advertisement industry the attention robbers that attack us and our children from this information jungle. And there's actually an attack going on all the time of taking this capacity of, you know, attentional control uh, away from us. There's an industry attacking us all of the time. And in a sense, that is an attack on the conscious self. It will change our experience of selfhood if we're not aware of it. And I think the good news is, I think um, that's something Evan and me share. There are old psychological techniques which are already there to stabilize and sustain attention that would be just the right thing in the current situation. So one thing I've been arguing for practically is to introduce uh, meditation lessons in schools in a completely ideolo ideology-free setting, just something like brushing, brushing your teeth, something every child should know and has a right to learn and to know in order to defend itself against these attacks on the conscious self from the internet. Okay. Yeah, I'm reminded actually of something that William James said. He said that habit is the basic unit of mental life. And, and he meant that both as an as a ethical statement and as a psychological statement. And by habit, he meant specifically habits of attention. And, and for James, James's whole conception of, of free will actually has to do with, with being able to direct and sustain your attention on what you choose, and that for him was the, was the essence of free will, and um, I think it's it's extremely important that, and this is something that animates my work a lot, that that we that we have the means to train ourselves to be attentive, 
and to do so in the face of the challenges to attention that, that are that are being presented to us by these by these new technologies. I think I think of meditation as a spiritual technology, which would be a counterpart to these other kinds of technologies. Um, here's a question I have to read to see if I understand it. Maybe you will. Thomas maintains that the self does not exist because its presence is dependent upon the neurological functions of the brain. But doesn't the objective world essentially cease to exist without a subject to observe and interpret it? In this way, isn't the objective world philosophically non-self-sufficient and thus philosophically non-existent? <laughs> oh, deep waters. <laughs> Give you <laughs> I mean, we know about external and objective reality not through single brains and single con streams of conscious experience, but through scientific communities. Other people stay awake. Uh, so I think there's good evidence that the uh, world actually doesn't disappear when I go to sleep or in, under anesthesia. The phenomenal world model disappears, but um, of course, we have good reason to believe that an external language independent, mind independent reality exists, and simply through theories. And theories are constructed not by individual conscious selves, but by whole communities of human beings. And I think there are some good reasons to believe an external world actually does exist. I don't know what the other speakers think. I'm a pretty old-fashioned guy. That's one of those, like, the afterlife that we might not be able to solve here. I, I think this is a good question to, to spend our last few minutes on. Um, what are the implications of embodied consciousness for responsibility and decision-making? Um, what, what are the ethical implications of these questions we're raising here? And how do we use this knowledge? Well, this is this is something actually that uh, another another point I think I share with with Tomas that, that certainly we've talked about before, and that is the idea of an ethics of consciousness. Um, what what kinds of conscious states are are wholesome? What kinds of conscious states do we want to um, encourage in our children? What <coughs> um, habits of attention do we want to cultivate? Um, how do we want to train um, our meta awareness, our ability to be aware of the functioning of our own? Minds. Um, th these are these are of course scientific questions, um, but they're they're ethical questions, and so I I see uh, this scientific endeavor to understand consciousness, the sense of self, how how the sense of self arises or is constructed, to understand this from an experiential point of view, to understand it from a scientific point of view, is having ultimately ethical roots um, as a, as a project of self knowledge, but also an ethical. Um, agenda, you could say. What you know? How do we want our minds, our minds to be? And there was never a time in world history when this was a more pressing and and fundamentally important question. You know, a question this all raises for me, which is related to this, I think, is and maybe quantum physics would weigh into this interestingly. Um, even if we assert that the self, that the that this identity that each of us brings into the world, or we feel like we bring into the world, that this dies with our bodies. Um, isn't there some kind of imprint that our lives make on the cosmos, right? Thomas, you even said that, the, that self and consciousness has a social aspect. It's, it's bigger mm -hmm. than our bodies. And, and some of that impact remains when we well, <laughs> are gone. Maybe just very briefly, I mean, even on a ruthlessly, very strictly materialist point of view, one has to admit, the most strict materialist would have to admit that the evolution of life, nervous systems, and conscious experience, for instance, in this planet, on this planet, changed the nature of the physical universe itself. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, it, for the first time, it evolved systems that have an image of the world as a whole. Mm -hmm. So you could talk about it in terms of self-similarity. The universe becomes slightly more self-similar to by beings that have conscious integrated self models. But even more, I mean, we have these individual first person perspectives as, an, uh, um, as a result of this evolutionary process on our planet. And this changes in a modest but in an interesting way our view of the physical universe, I would say. It had the poten potential 
to evolve conscious first person perspectives. But we all our we also affect the consciousness of others. Right? I mean, sure. very directly, our children, right? H hence the ethical question: How do we use mm -hmm. this knowledge? But it's I mean, we we go around making an impact mm -hmm. on other conscious beings all the time. Perhaps I, I can add yes. something also about the ethical aspects. One of the intriguing aspects of people with a near-death experience is the transformation. When they have had a near-death experience, they all have a new life inside. And one of the major things is that they still feel connected with other people. They still feel connected with nature. They still feel connected with the endangered planet. Do they feel more connected than they did Far before more the connected. experience? And they have this kind of connectedness that they still experience. And they start to live differently. They start to help people. There are, there are more compassion, more empathy, etc. And I think one of the main things is the, the way we view the world is depending on the, our state of consciousness. I would say many are. When I'm in love, the world is beautiful. When I'm depressed, the world is awful. When I'm frightened because of the press and the politicians, the world gets full of fear. So it's depending on our own state of consciousness. When we can change our state of consciousness, we can change the world as well. Mm -hmm. And this is the ethical implication, but also in the negative way as well. Right. So we just have a few minutes left. I know Thomas has to catch a plane. I just want to bring this larger question of the implications of this right down to the ground as we con conclude. I mean, how do you live differently? How do you work with the idea of the meaning of your life because of these ideas that you work with? Well, it has, for me, I don't know about the other two speakers, for me it has sobering effects. I read neuropsychological literature a lot, case studies, what happens after certain forms of brain damage, how it changes the sense of self. And I become acutely aware of what could happen to me and everybody else every minute if just a little blood vessel explodes in my brain. So I've become very much aware that also my psychological properties are something very delicate and vulnerable. And also that they stem, and that's something one cannot believe somehow, from a process, an evolutionary process, that had no goal and no direction, that was merciless, uh, sacrificed many of my ancestors. I think evolution is not something one can glorify. And in my work, I have really become more and more aware um, that we are suffering beings, and that we better take more care about ourselves and uh, have more respect to, uh, about each other and in our interpersonal relationships and that we should maybe look to old-fashioned philosophical questions like, as Evan said, not only what is a good action, but what is a valuable state of consciousness uh, under these conditions we find ourselves in. Uh, so evolution had no goal or no direction, but we as conscious beings can and should give it give this direction, give direction to our lives. Right, our whole mind works like that. I, I, I think you cannot really, if you're honest, intuitively understand. Can you understand that evolution had no goal and no direction? That's the glasses onto which we use to look onto reality. Things must have a direction and a goal, else we don't understand them. Um, so we discover things scientifically which are very hard to digest for us. And um, I think we can be open about this talk about it. It's not easy to be intellectually honest in these times. Um, these are things I think about. Mm. Okay. Evan. Uh, well, um, I, I suppose just speaking personally, what's important for me is to try to embody as best I can um, the, the, the kinds of things that I'm working with in, in the meditative contemplative tradition. So that means in, in my own life, trying to, to, to maintain that kind of familiarity with the own, my own first person workings of attention and so on, but also to, to show that that's something that students can do. You know, I teach a lot of philosophy of mind classes, and I try to show students that, that you know, philosophy of mind can be embodied in a personal way through these, in, through these contemplative uh, uh, practices, and that in a way that's actually the, the true deep animating spirit of philosophy. I mean, philosophy is the love of wisdom. It's tied in history to 
um, to what some philosophers today call spiritual exercises. And, and this, this needs to be brought back to, in to animate philosophy. So I, I try to, to live and embody as much of that as, as best I can. Yes, I'm not talking about philosophy. I'm talking about, uh, again, what I've learned from those people with the near-death experience. It's what it's all about in life is compassion, empathy, first to oneself, to accept your own dark side as well, and then to others and to nature and to the planet. And we have to change our consciousness to change the world and to, to survive. We, we have to remember that are also our grandchildren will have to survive here on this planet. And we have to change the society we live in. It, not the competitive. Competitive society is also the weak creatures and the children worldwide will be the people who lose. So uh, I'm very positive. And it's all about the now. It's all about the change of ourselves to change the world. Well, I. I hope this was a good beginning. It certainly was just a beginning. Um, thank you all for coming. This is fantastic.